talk to you this morning really just about the believer's authority because Jesus Christ has given us authority. You know, when you look at Luke chapter 4, verse 5 onwards, we clearly see that at the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us the devil led Jesus to a high place. He wasn't talking about leading to the top of a hill or anywhere like that. This high place was in a supernatural realm, so he was able to see supernaturally. And the Bible says he showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And then the devil said to Jesus, I will give you all their authority, all their splendor, if you, if you, uh, because it's been given to me. And he basically said he would give it in if you would worship me, it will be yours. And we need to understand, really from scripture, that Satan is saying that he's been given authority. And we, we need to understand the truth also. The truth is that God never gave Satan any authority. He never gave Satan authority over man. He never gave Satan authority over the earth. God, in fact, gave Adam and man authority. All the works of his hands, everything that swam in the sea, everything that flew in the air, everything that moved along the ground, the word of God tells us very clearly that Adam, under the authority of God, was made supreme ruler of. He was given total authority over all God's creation. So when Satan entered the garden and started to tempt Eve, Adam was right at her side. The Bible makes that very clear. He was with her, should have protected her, should have covered her. But not only that, Adam actually had authority to drive Satan out of the garden. But his refusal to take authority actually led really to the fall of mankind. And every person after Adam inherited his sinful nature. Now the moment Adam and Eve obeyed the suggestions of the serpent, the Bible makes it very clear that they died spiritually first and then later they died physically. The same as Jesus Christ is referred in the Bible as the last Adam, not the second Adam, the last Adam. And the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ died spiritually on the cross. For three hours, he was cut off for Father's presence. Cut off so you could have entry in. So he's cut off from his father's presence. And after those three hours, he died physically. So Jesus experienced exactly what Adam experienced. And cutting off spiritually and then a physical death. All this he did on your behalf. But the, but the thing I want to point out to you is that when Adam sinned, a transaction took place. Adam unwittingly handed over his rights, his authority to Satan. And that's why the Bible tells us that Satan became the God of this world. And this is why Jesus, uh, when he was speaking to Jesus, he said, all authority has been given to me. Now, for many believers today, they carry a misunderstanding really about Satan's authority. And as long as you continue to talk about Satan having authority and all that wrong belief system about his authority, you actually empower him over your life. You've got to understand what the Word of God says. You see, Father spoke to me just this week. I was reading through Luke chapter 4. And Father spoke to me about it. And then he gave me, you know, scripture from Matthew 28, verse 18. And this is Jesus speaking. And Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I command you. And surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. So who has all authority in heaven and on earth? Who has authority now? The word of God is very clear that Jesus Christ has all authority. If Jesus Christ has all authority in heaven and on earth, that means he has all, it leaves nothing to the enemy. The enemy does not have authority. The amazing truth is this, that God has given you authority. He's given you authority. He's given that authority to the church. Jesus always had authority. When Jesus is saying this, he's saying that authority is given me to give to the church so they can operate in my stead. Amen. So that authority has been given to you and me. 
Now let me just say this to you. Satan no longer has authority because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on your behalf. He doesn't have authority. Now you might say, well, if he doesn't have authority, why is he messing so many things up in my life? Why is he messing so many things up in the world? Well, the truth is this. He doesn't have authority. He simply has ability. That's all. Not authority, but ability. The Bible calls Satan a thief. The Bible tells us that the thief came to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. A quality of life within him. That was Jesus' mandate. But the mandate of the enemy was to steal from you. To ultimately kill and destroy you. But the Bible calls him a thief. A thief. Let me just make this clear. A thief does not have authority to take something from you. Satan is a thief. A thief has ability. A thief may have a gun. A thief may have a knife. A thief may have a laptop. He does not have authority. Have you ever had your account fiddled? Have you ever had someone con you in some way? That's a thief. But that thief never had your authority. What he did, he had an ability that he used against you. And the enemy uses his ability against you. But you have authority to put an end to what the enemy is doing in your life. You've got to stop saying that Satan has authority. He does not have authority anymore. Because according to that scripture, I would sooner believe that scripture than believe what you were saying. That scripture says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Satan does not have that authority anymore. He knows that. He just does not want you to know that. We've got to start to rise up. All he has is ability. Amen. We need to catch that revelation that authority has been given to you. So that you can act in Jesus' stead. You're supposed to represent the Lord Jesus Christ on earth. And to act and to do as he would do. And he's telling you today that you have authority. Authority. You know what authority is? Authority is the power or the right to give orders. It's the power or the right to make decisions. It's the power or right to enforce obedience. That's why when you drive out a demon in the name of Jesus, you're enforcing obedience. That demon has to obey. So we've got to be people that recognise the authority that we have and start to apply the word of God. So we have to be like policemen in every situation by applying God's word, God's truth. That was how Jesus dealt with the enemy. He quoted the word of God. And the enemy had to back down because the word of God is truth and forever the word of God is settled in heaven. The word of God is established. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will never pass away. It's eternal because it's come from the living God. So we're going to start to apply the word of God. Think about sickness and disease for a moment where you should be taking authority. Sickness and disease do not produce the life that God desires within your life. Amen. So if it's not producing life, it's not producing what God desires, why are you putting up with those particular things? What it does, it produces death ultimately. Therefore, you have to see sicknesses, diseases, all these things as an enemy and not as a friend. Some people see it as a friend. They see it as a friend because they think from a sickness they can get a benefit, get a mobility car. So they see it as a friend. You've got to see it as an enemy. Well, I don't have to work if I've got a sickness. It is not your friend. It's going to kill you. So many believers today are allowing the enemy to do what he wants. Listen, you cannot co-inhabit with sickness. You cannot uh, live at peace alongside sickness. Mm. You've got to start to rise up and do something about it. If you think for a moment about your house, you wouldn't allow a destructive, a divisive person to move into your house. Because they may start off occupying one room, but they will spread out over a period of time. And you will have problems. They will start to affect that household, and the effects will be devastating. And yet we allow sicknesses into our house. We allow their conditions. 
what it's doing in our life to remain totally unchallenged. We just put up with it. We just live with it. That is not what God told us to do. We're to use authority in the areas of sickness. You've got to use that God-given authority and command those sicknesses, those conditions, those injuries that have caused symptoms in your body to go from your life. What you're experiencing isn't what God wants. It's not producing life. It's producing death. It's not come from him. Jesus eradicated sickness everywhere that Jesus went. He eradicated it. How did Jesus do that? Did Jesus break out into prayer every moment? Absolutely not. In Mark 11, verse 22 to 23, he told people to speak to the mountain. He didn't say, pray about your mountain. He said, speak to it, faith command. What mountain is affecting your life? What mountain is sickness? That you don't seem to be able to get round or climb over. Well, you're not meant to get round it. You're not meant to climb over it. You're meant to remove it. That's right. And Jesus tells us to remove it through our words. We've got to speak to it. Have you ever read in the book of Zechariah about Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel was raised up and commissioned to build the house of God, to re-establish the worship of the living God. But he experienced opposition. Whenever you want to serve the living God, you are guaranteed this, you will get opposition. The Apostle Paul says, a great door for effective work is open for me, but there is much opposition. So when a door opens for you, there is opposition. And the enemy will oppose you and use others to oppose you. So in the life of Zerubbabel, there were people like governors and counsellors that opposed him. Well, these governors and counsellors that will oppose you, and I'm not just talking in the natural realm, I'm talking in the supernatural realm. That the governors and the counsellors and the principalities and the powers, the rulers, the authorities, the spirits of wickedness in heavenly places, they will oppose you. They do not want you to fulfil your God-given destiny. They do not want you to be the person that God desires you to be. Or to move into your breakthrough. And so there's opposition. So the rubber wall was it in opposition that seemed to be on a natural level, but there was spiritual power behind it. Amen. And it was hindering him in his work, so there was discouragement coming in. Every turn he made, there was opposition. You ever felt like that? Well, the word of God tells us that Zerubbabel was encouraged by the word of God. We know, and we quote the scripture, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Well, what about the scripture that says, who are you, O mountain, to stand before Zerubbabel? Be leveled in the name of Jesus. You see, the mountain was to be leveled. And one of the ways you level the mountain before you is to speak to it. You continue to speak to situations. You continue to speak to your problems, your difficulties, until they align with the word of God, until you see them come about. So we're going to speak into those situations. What tends to happen with believers, they talk to God about the mountain. Where in the Bible does it say that? You know, I'm not knocking the power of prayer, but let's get this into, uh, into perspective. We've got to use the authority and the faith command. Jesus spent time in prayer. But he also knew what it was to use faith command to speak to situations. And you've got to do the same. Why talk to God about your mountain when God says speak to it? He's already given you advice in that area on how you deal with your mountain. You'll talk to anyone about your mountain. You need to talk to what you talk to mountains? Yes. What problems affecting you that you need to speak to? Because when God created you, he created you in his image and likeness. And God used faith command to bring the world into existence. And he wants you to do exactly the same. This is why Jesus says, have faith in God or have the God type of faith to speak into situations. There is nothing that you, if you speak to, will not start to adjust. Just because you don't see it adjust instantly doesn't mean adjustment isn't taking place. When Jesus cursed the fig tree, the Bible says it withered from the roots, the unseen realm. But 
change took place instantly. When Jesus cursed and said, you know, no one's going to eat fruit from you ever again. It was dead the moment Jesus spoke. It just looked, took a little bit of time for it to appear. And it's the same in your situation. You need to start to speak. Speak to those sickness. Speak to those diseases that are affecting you. Speak to those conditions. There is not a problem in your life that you speak into will not change. We need to use the word of God and declare it clearly declare what God is saying in those situations. So the word of God tells us to speak. Zerubbabel started to experience a tremendous breakthrough in those areas. Mountains were leveled before him. And we need to level mountains before him. You know, when you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, there was no limitations upon him. The Bible says that he had the spirit without limit. And he operated from the fullness of that spirit. But yet when we read through the word of God, we find that Jesus went into a place. You know, when he went into Nazareth, the Bible says that he could do no miracles there except <clears throat> heal a few that were sick. Jesus still, excuse me, Jesus still healed the sick. Many of us read that scripture and we think, well, Jesus Christ was limited by unbelief. Jesus was not limited by unbelief. The people's unbelief limited them receiving the miracles of Jesus. And that's the truth you need to understand. It's not the unbelief that limits Jesus. Because Jesus spoke to many unbelievers and they received from him. He received miracles. I spoke to unbelievers. I talked to people who clearly told me they're skeptics, they don't believe the word of God, and yet Jesus has healed them. All unbelief will do will hinder a person receiving. It's just like you preaching the gospel on the street and there's 20 people around you. 10 receive the word of God and 10 don't. Their unbelief stops them receiving what God wants to do. It doesn't limit God's power. And I'm saying God's power to heal, to, to bring about miracles is greater than any person's unbelief. It does not faze me dealing with an unbeliever because I know God's power is greater. And you've got to understand that particular truth, that God's power is greater. So when Jesus is speaking about the situation, prophets who have no honor in their own place, people that are not believing, their unbelief is causing them to fail in receiving what Jesus Christ wants to do. But we can break through all those things. You see, even where sickness is concerned, diseases are concerned, we sometimes think, well, if there's sin in a person's life, we can't deal with the sickness. That's not true. Absolutely not true. Yes, we want a person to live right. We want the person to put away the sin in their lives that may be a cause of certain things. But if you look at the pool of Bethesda, the Bible healed that, but the, the Bible tells us that Jesus healed that man. Mm. But Jesus later found him and said, see you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse will come. Mm. So was he in a simple position? Absolutely. But Jesus Christ broke through. Mm. And I've seen Jesus Christ do that. And what tends to happen is that person then makes adjustments in their life because they've experienced God's goodness and God's grace. <clears throat> but when Jesus Christ ministered to any person, you will find he never went into prayer. There is no account of Jesus praying for anyone. The only account you would read of anything close to that is when he called Lazarus forth, but he didn't pray for his benefit. He said, I pray for their benefit. Amen. What Jesus did, he used faith command. Amen. He spoke. He spoke. That same method of bringing about success is available to you today. But you see, what we do, we talk to God about the problem. And God says, I don't want you to talk to me about the problem. I want you to speak to the problem and bring in the solution. Speak the answer in those situations. What are you going through? Is there shortage in your life today? Is there lack in your life? Doesn't God say in his word very, very clearly, that our God will supply all your needs according to his glory, his riches, 
in Christ Jesus. So where there's lack in your life, <clears throat> instead of just saying to the Lord, Father, I've got all this lack, will you meet my needs? God is saying to you, speak to you about it, start to call it in. Amen. Every mountain of restriction, every mountain blocking my finances, in the name of Jesus Christ, you will be leveled, you will move out of the way. You do not even have to work out how God will do it. That is not your job, not your responsibility. Amen. You're just going to do what he tells you to do and stay in that belief situation. So you speak to something and you continue to speak to it day in, day out until it aligns, until it changes. Amen. So your body's aching. You say, oh, I've tried this. Yeah, you tried it, but you gave up. It's just like saying to a doctor, well, I tried that antibiotic. Well, how many did you try? Well, I did it for two days. I told you to do it for 10 days. <laughs> You won't get well. You've got to continue with things until those things start to bring about an amazing change. And this is what Jesus did. He used faith command continuously. Pick up your mat and walk. Father, would you enable him to have the strength to pick up his mat? No, he didn't pray that way. That's what Christians do. Lord, if it's your will, he'll pick up his mat. Maybe you want me to be sick, Lord. Maybe you want to teach me things through sickness. No, Jesus wants to teach you to get rid of the sickness because it is not the life of God. He's come that you may have life and life more abundantly. How can you have an abundant life when you can't walk? <clears throat> How can you have abundant life when you can't talk or you can't hear? You cannot. Now, I'm not knocking anyone who's sick because the Bible tells us to heal the sick. Amen. It's a command, heal the sick. Raise the dead, cleanse the leper, drive out demons. The early church were commissioned to do things the way that Jesus did it. He told them to preach the word of God. He told them to preach the word of God and to say that the kingdom of God is at hand. It's in easy reach of every person. What I'm saying to you today is in easy reach of you. That's why the Apostle Paul says you don't have to go up to heaven to bring it down or to the depths to bring it up. That word of God, it's in your heart, it's in your mouth. You've got to declare the things of God Amen. into your situations for them to change. And stop empowering the enemy. Oh, the devil's having a go at me. Well, why don't you have a go in? <laughs> <laughs> Believers constantly talk about the devil's having a go at me. Oh, he's doing this, he's doing that, he's got hold of this, he's got hold of them. You're empowering him. You're giving him credit where credit is not due. Mm. He is giving you authority to do something about the situation. And you're saying, God, will you do something? And God said, why should I do something when I've told you to do something? <laughs> Be obedient to the word of God. Well, I'll go away and pray about it. We use prayer in a way, you know, to try to justify our lack of, of obedience. We've got to be people that obey the word of God, not pray about it. Mm. So prayer can be disobedience. Mm. Should I marry that man? I know he's not saved, should I marry him? <laughs> Why are you praying about that? <laughs> the word of God has already spoken about it. Mm -hmm. it tells you not to be unequally God. Yeah, but I love him. I, I think I can change him. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Let me just say, how many women have said that? <laughs> They'll give up drinking beer until they've got the ring on your finger and then he's back in the pub. Mm. You will not change him. Only God has the power to change that. Do what God says and he'll bring the right person along. Right. Come on. We need to be obedient to what God is saying. There is not a sickness, there is not a problem, there is not an issue that comes against you that you can't deal with. When Jesus Christ dealt with people with sicknesses and diseases, you will find that Jesus Christ often delivered people from demonic powers. Christians don't like to hear that today. But the Bible is making it very clear that they were the power behind the sickness. They were the, the spirits that were causing the sicknesses, the diseases, the ailments, the conditions in people's lives. Those things that stubbornly refused to move. <clears throat> Jesus dealt with all those things. And he commissioned the church to do the same. First, he commissioned the 12, didn't he? The Bible tells us that he went out. Demons were subject to them in Jesus' name because he gave them his authority. Amen. 
He commissioned the 70. They went out and came back and said, Lord, even demons are subject to us in your name because he'd given them authority. And finally, he commissioned the church. And he said, these signs will follow those who believe in my name. In my name, you shall drive out demons. Why would Jesus say you will drive out demons as the first sign gift? Why would he do that? Because he knew the demons were holding people in bondage. He knew the demons were holding people in sicknesses and diseases, holding them in anger and moods and attitudes and behavior patterns. He knew that the enemy was driving them so they weren't living as free as they ought to, to live. So he commissioned the 12, he commissioned the 70, he commissioned the church to drive those things out. Why aren't we seeing that today in many of our churches? Because it isn't popular. Well, you know what, folks? I'm not into popularity. It's obedience we should be into. And we've got to do things the way that Jesus did. So when you're encountering something, you can even look at the sickness, look at the disease, and see it's not producing life. It's producing death. Therefore, it's not of God. It's going to be of the enemy. And we start to deal with it on those particular grounds. Everybody... Everybody champions Smith Wigglesworth today. They all talk about what a great man of God he was, a great man of faith. You know what Wigglesworth said? If you treat sicknesses as a demonic power, you're not got far wrong. I don't want to quote him that very often, but that's the truth. And we need to break it. I've seen people healed, not because of prayed for the healing, because of removed the offending spirit. And then healing breaks out with no prayer for healing. They start to produce out. Look at Luke chapter 13. The lady who had a spirit of infirmity. 18 long years that woman suffered. She went into the house of God on a regular basis. She was a Jewish. Jesus even said she was a daughter of Abraham, a true believer. She would go into that synagogue. You think people in their, their love for her or their compassion for her never prayed for her? Absolutely they would have prayed for him, but with no results. If you're praying for someone and you see no results, don't be blaming God. Change the way you are dealing or your ministry to that person. Mm -hmm. Jesus continually used faith command mm -hmm. and the laying on of hands mm -hmm. because it was a transference of virtue into the sickness. Mm -hmm. His life was flowing. The power of God would drive things out. He ministered those ways. We've got to do exactly the same today. Satan knows you have authority. He just doesn't want you to know it. He knows you have authority to change those conditions you have lived with for years. You see, some believers never have a desire to change the condition. They're just happy to get a prescription every month. Get the pills delivered so they can get them delivered to your house now. <laughs> get those things delivered. They're happy to be taking them, and they manage sickness rather than putting it away. There is no account in the Bible of Jesus managing sickness. Oh, you poor, you poor fellow. Just put, just put this saddle on it. <laughs> the answer for that. Just, just take your buttercup syrup. He didn't deal with that. He dealt with issues. And he didn't allow the condition of the person's heart to stand in the way. Jesus healed mm -hmm. ten lepers. Only one came back. Only one, and he said he was a foreigner. Outside of the common, what God he means by that? Doesn't mean you, you come from Africa. <laughs> or anything like that. It means outside the common of God. But he healed them all. Did they all have a good attitude? Absolutely not. He healed all in the multitude. It would be impossible for you to have a multitude of believers, mm -hmm. people, together and not have somebody with a bad attitude. Mm -hmm. You can't have a gathering of believers today without someone in the group having a bad attitude. Mm -hmm. Don't like what he said. When I get a chance, I'll tell him. <laughs> they can tell me all what you want. Well, I'll disagree with you. If God has told me to say a certain thing, so there are many believers that have bad attitudes. Where's that bad attitude come? Demonic power. It's a demonic power that's not agreeing. Mm. And Christians have wrong belief systems. A Christian can't have a demon. Mm. 
Where does that thought come from? That thought comes from the enemy that's within you to keep itself safe within your life. So the enemy lies to you, gives you all sorts of thoughts. You know, it's interesting really that when you get thoughts, you know, when, when God speaks to me, you know how he speaks in thoughts I don't recognise the real. It's the primary way he speaks. Yeah, he can speak in different ways, dreams, visions, bringing all sorts of words, but it tends to bring thoughts in that filter through. But those thoughts have a voice. And they have a voice because it's a personality speaking to me. So when you're getting a thought that has a voice, and it's not of God, it's a personality that's speaking to you, you need to be free. Mm -hmm. to free in those areas but we don't like it's everybody else that needs to be free except me well that will suit them this is why you get believers never come for prayer mm -hmm. believers never go through deliverance mm -hmm. well you know when Philip went to Samaria and preached to Christ the Bible says with streets evil spirits came out mm -hmm. you find that happened first people got saved people got healed it was great joy in the city but with streets, crying out, manifestations, demons came out of people's lives. You know why? Philip the evangelist knew how to minister the way that Jesus did. And what he was doing was removing those demonic powers from people's lives so that when they come into faith, they're not struggling. What we do now, we tell believers, they can't have a demon. They come into church and they've got problems. They think, well, their life was all right for the first couple of weeks. And now they're experiencing all these issues all these problems, maybe this Christian life isn't cracked up to what it used to be, what it's made out to be. And there are many who experience that. If you've got young people giving their life to the Lord and you're never telling them that they need to be delivered, you will find they will have problems, they will have issues in their life, and they will think that the faith is of what it's meant to be. That it's Jesus is not at all that he's meant to be. So you have to tell them the truth and you have to remove things if you remove things first from your life, it leaves more room for the Holy Spirit to fill. Yeah. We get it the wrong way around. We get a person who's absolutely wicked, you know, a son of hell. They give the light to the Lord Jesus Christ and we won't fill them with the Holy Spirit. But what about all the issues in their life? Sometimes you've got to empty all that stuff out in order for it to be full. And that's what God wants to do within people's lives. But those early believers... Not only did they experience themselves freedom, but they started to minister freedom into other people's lives. And the Lord's just reminding me, you know, of Simon the Sorcerer. You know, Simon the Sorcerer influenced people. The Bible tells that he influenced people great and low, high and low. So in the society that he was living in, in Samaria, he influenced politicians, he influenced governors, he influenced celebrities. He influenced people that were over finance. He influenced everything that went on in that city. One man, under the influence of witchcraft, influenced the entire city. Mm -hmm. So God does God do? He sends one man, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, to break that power. Simon was amazed, absolutely amazed, at the miracles that he saw were taking place. Mm -hmm. Philip was moving, miracles were taking place. So the Bible tells us that he followed him around. He himself became a believer and was baptized. Well, then when he saw that through the laying on of hands, the gift of the Holy Spirit would come, he thinks, I just still want to be in that prominent place. I still want to have a name for myself. So he goes to Peter, and not because he'd won it, but the ability to lay hands upon people so they would receive the Holy Spirit. And he says, let your money perish for you. And he started to speak about issues within his life. You see, he got saved, but he hadn't got rid of the issues within his life. And that's the reason why you have so many problems. Amen. Because you never consider that the enemy is occupying a room of your life. He may be, a, you know, your, your house, it may be like a 10-bedroom ten, a ten mansion. But what are those rooms the enemy is occupying? And the enemy wants to spread out a bit more. Doesn't it? But you never consider he's occupying that room we are. Where does your bad attitude come from? Where does your moodiness come from? 
Where does your sulking come from? Where does your anger issues come from? Where do your addictions come from? The things that drive your life. Where does your selfish ambition come from? Where does your love of money come from? Where does your stinginess come from? All these things come from the enemy's camp and it's only in an area of your life and you'll never move into complete freedom because you are giving him authority in your life. You would not allow someone just to walk in your house this afternoon and start to take your guts. But yet you do that spiritually. The enemy's walked in your house and he said, you know, by the way, I'm staying here. And you need to kick him out. If someone just walked in your house you would have them out that front front door rapping. <laughs> you need to do the same where the enemy is concerned. The Bible tells you you've got to force a bit the enemy. You can't counsel the enemy out. You can't speak nice to him. Can you please leave, Mr. Devil? <laughs> it isn't going to happen. It won't work that way. You cannot medicate him out. Well, I've been to the doctors and they give me this medication. Well, you take your medication. It may affect you. He may start to damage you. He may even ensnare you more. You know, there's power behind medications. Lots of medications, if you was to read the side effects to them, you wouldn't take them. And the power behind them is the spirit of pharmacia. And as you start to depend on them continuously, that spirit gets a grip upon your life. You can't bring them out them. We need to force them evict the enemy. You don't counsel him out, you don't medicate him out, the Bible says you evict him. You drive him out. How do you drive him out? By using command. That command that Jesus Christ says you have authority to do. In fact, the Bible tells us in Luke 10 verse 19, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Snakes are often deadly, scorpions less so. Scorpions will cause you severe pain. Absolutely severe pain. You'll be in torment for them. He's telling us types of spirits there. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. So the scorpions will torment you in different areas of your life. How many people today are tormented mentally? We've got young people that are suffering from anxieties and depressions. They're only 15. Some are even younger. You've got youngsters, teenagers, killing themselves today. Where's that from? It's a demonic power that's driving them in those areas. Jesus said, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the works of the enemy. So the snakes and the scorpions, those things that cause death, those things that torment you, every type, every kind of spirit is giving you authority over. I have given you authority to trample on them to put them under foot you ever read where joshua had trapped five kings in a cave and he called his commanders to bring the kings out and he said to his commanders put your foot on their neck in other words take authority over them joshua could have put his foot on their neck he already had authority he knew he was a what he was doing was equipping his commanders to do the same and that's exactly what jesus christ is doing to you today You've got to put your foot upon the neck of the enemy. And if he starts to wriggle a bit, dig, in, dig those eye heels in, ladies. <laughs> dig those eyes in, fellas. <laughs> if you're wearing high heels and you're a fella today, you need to get out here. <laughs> and we'll pray for you and we'll deliver you. In fact, without going too deep in that subject, all this LGBT stuff, what you tolerate today will absolutely upset tomorrow. It's demonic. Demonic. We need to be people that bring people into freedom. So Jesus said, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the works of the enemy. Did he say a few things of the enemy? He said all the works of the enemy. Everything that the enemy brings against you, you have authority to do something about. Oh, pastor, pastor, I'm going through all this issue. Can you come round and deal? Why are you dealing with it? Why do people have to bring someone to one person all the, all the time? You know, it's like myself, I'm one person. And by the grace of God, I'll do what God has called me to do. But I'm one person. Every believer has to start to rise up and use authority. Let's start to cause the enemy to have problems. 
Don't settle for what you've got right now. Amen. Start to change it. Start to say, you know what, Lord? If what Pastor Dave is saying is true, then I'm going to start to speak to my problems. I'm going to speak to arthritis. Why do you not think that's come from God, do you? God doesn't want you crippled. God wants you to speak to that. There's a power behind you. You start to speak to it. Oh, my knees are a bit dodgy these days. I think I'm going to have to go in for a knee replacement. Do you really think that's God's best for you? I don't think it's God's best for you. I know it's not God's best for you. You start to speak in the name. Michael had arthritis, he said in his knee. He got prayer. He went back, they checked it, he said, there's no arthritis in that knee at all. He's not got a problem in that knee. Jesus Christ healed him. And he would do the same. What he would do for one, he would do for another. You're going to start to speak it over your life. Speak the health of Christ over your life. Why allow the enemy to call in habit with you? Blood pressure tablets, statins. You run all these things for life. Well, I've got good cholesterol and bad cholesterol problems. If you've got a cholesterol problem, start to speak to it. Start to speak. Your liver starts to produce the right amount. Start to speak. You've got diabetes today. Do you think that's of God? Absolutely not. But why do we live with it? Why do we just put up with it? Start to speak in the name of Jesus. Command your pancreas to produce the right amount of insulin or sugar within your body. That it works correctly and functions correctly. You've got to start to speak. Any power affecting an organ of our body, I command you out in the name of Jesus Christ. But be serious. He's giving you, a, he's giving you authority. Satan does not have authority anymore. When Jesus died on Calvary's cross, he bought back all that was lost in the fall of Adam. All. And he's given it to you. He's re-established you. You just need to know that truth and start to operate on that level that Satan does, does not have authority. He has ability. But it's wrecking the children's lives. They're all rebellious. They're all going through, th through things. You're a priest and king unto the Lord. Start to take authority. Oh, what can you take authority over somebody else? After all, they've got the will. Yes, you can when they're under you. Yes, you can, because the enemy is disadvantaging them, and you need to take authority and drive the enemy out of his life. Every spur of depression affecting my son and daughter, I command you to go right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You will not affect them again. And you start to get violent in those areas. The word of God is very, very clear. Jesus said, referring to John the Baptist, the kingdom of God from the time of John to the present has been forcefully advancing and the violent take it by force. Your little polite prayers to the enemy will not affect anything. He understands the language of violence when you use the scripture against him and use your authority. Will you be someone that does that today? Maybe you're here today, you've sickness in your body, you've disease in your body, your conditions that you're managing, you've never really prayed much about them, you've just accepted them, it's just your lot in life. No, it is not. You are not a candidate for sickness, diseases. You are not a candidate for poverty, you're not a candidate for failure. You're a candidate for success in Jesus Christ. But Jesus is not going to bring that about unless you start to agree with his word and speak it out. I know this to be true because in my own life I've received healing this way. I read in the word of God where God says, and now, meaning right now in your present situation, and now let the weak say I am strong. And I realized the weak person was to declare they are strong even when they were feeling weak, even when they looked weak, even when other people told them they were weak, they were to declare they were strong. That is not lying. It is not lying. It is declaring truth. It is agreeing with the word of God. And you've got to speak words of agreement with the word of God. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray right now. If you need prayer today. 
You can sit there and go on the Bible scrolls, but it doesn't really apply to me. The enemy may be holding you in the sickness of disease. He may be holding you in condition. He may be holding your family in such an unhappy situation. You need to be free. You need to come for prayer. Just to be released in those areas. It's the enemy that keeps you sat down. It's not the living God. You don't have pride to keep you there. Pride will hold you and you will never encounter the Lord to the degree of capacity you are. Pride drove the enemy from the presence of God and it will drive you away from the presence of God and all that he wants to do. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I just simply pray that you would cause your people to understand what has been shared today. That they would understand that they have been given authority in the name of Jesus Christ. That they to stand in the stead of Jesus. That when they use a fake command, he said that Jesus himself was using a fake command. Father, I simply pray there would be divine turnarounds, amazing breakthroughs, that miracles would break out in your people's lives because they would buy and take hold and ownership of what they have heard today in the powerful name of Jesus and they would not let go. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus that they would have a tenacious faith. They would bite in and, Lord, they would not release those teeth until they get, Father God, exactly what they're speaking to. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, would you move in power today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.